Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Praise God. I believe that you will be blessed this morning. This message is uh, big in my heart. And uh, I'm just praying for uh, others and the ability to get it out, all out. And uh, I believe people, absolutely, I know people will be blessed and ministered today. Praise God. And uh, how many of you brought your Bible? Hallelujah. Glory to God. I encourage you, if you didn't, next time you show up, bring a Bible. Praise God. Why? Well, so you have your own, uh, your own tool. <laughs> the most important tool, right? Is the Word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray and we'll get into today's message. Lord, we just thank you for your Word. Lord, I fully expect for you to think for me, speak through my vocal cords, that this word would come forth unhindered, uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic force. Lord, I thank you that this word is delivered with compassion and it is received with understanding. And Lord, you desire to help us. That's why you've given us your word. That's why you've placed the fivefold ministry into the earth to instruct, to teach, to equip. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that we will leave here changed in Jesus' name by the power of your word. And Lord, I thank you that we'll be able to identify areas in our minds, in our thoughts, in our lives that have tried to become corrupt, wicked, and perverted. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you. I'm glad you're here. I want to say some things to you before we go into the message here. We're in, I uh, believe, part 27 in a, title, in a message entitled, Transformed, Not Conformed. Right? Transformed, Not Conformed. Conformed. Say that with me. Transformed, not conformed. Now the world would have it that we would be conformed to the way the world lives, the way the world thinks, the world, way the world acts. Correct. And if it was up to the devil, that's how he would have us to think and to live is like the world lives. But we don't have to live like the world lives. Is that correct? We've been given the Word of God to give us instruction and insight and wisdom so that we know how we are to live as Christians. And I've asked that the senior high youth be in here, because I believe this message is quite possibly one of the most important messages that I've ever delivered. Um, I'm called to minister to people. People are my business. And the purpose of my calling is to be a help. To be a help to each of you here. To be a help to those who even hear this message you know, online and on YouTube and things like that. I am pro-people. I'm laying this up for a reason. You know that, right? And I desire to be used by God in a mighty and powerful way to bless people. And I'm not against people. And God has given us His Word for instruction for our lives. Is that right? To equip us, to give us knowledge, and to give us understanding in all areas of life. Say all areas of life. Not just one particular area, but all areas of life. You know, in the book of John, I don't want you to turn there yet, but I just want you to listen here for a few minutes. In the book of John, it says that in the beginning was the Word. Right? In the beginning. And if you believe the Bible, then you need to believe the whole Bible. And when it says in the beginning was the Word, right? We know that in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> Not too hard to figure out, is it? And so we know that the Word, since it's done since the beginning, that what we do as Christians is say, okay, now God's Word <laughs> was in the beginning. And so we're going to say, that is the starting point. That is 
where our life is founded on the Word of God. Not a religion, not a denomination, but on the Word of God. Right? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. And the Word, we know the Word still is God. We know that from the Scriptures. He says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, or the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him, or we could say in the Word, was life. Right? And the life was and is the light of men. This Word is light for our lives. It gives us insight. It enables us to see correctly and properly. The Word, the words in the Bible give us instruction, and those instructions enable us to see correctly how we are to live and how we are to think. Amen. I tell you, Jesus was praying Paul and his disciples get into this boat, let's go over to the other side of this, this lake. Correct? Mark chapter 4. And as they're crossing this lake, there was a great storm. This great storm described to the Greek, if you, you say that to the Greek language, it was a storm unlike any other natural storm that had ever existed. This storm was something that was caused in the spiritual realm. And as a result of the spiritual turbulence, the wind and the waves became extremely violent to the point that these men that were in this boat, even those that were experienced fishermen, had, had been in many storms as fishermen on the water. They were in fear for their life and asked the fact that they were going to die. But Jesus rose up in that boat, and he rebuked the wind, which was the unseen force. And he spoke to the waves, peace be still, and the Bible described a great calm. It went from a great storm to a great calm. And I believe that in your life, you may be experiencing a great storm, but you can also experience a great calm that quick. And I believe this message is really going to clear some areas up in people's lives and in their mind and their thinking. Because we are not to follow the ideals of society. In Revelation 19, 13, I just quoted to you John chapter 1, where we said, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made, it was made, right? And in Him was the light, and the light was the light of men. But so now, in Revelation, we see that, and I, we read this on Thursday evening, it says, And he was clothed with a vesture, this is Revelation 19, 13, clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. If you want to know God's idea on something, you got to know his Word on it. Now, I know that everyone... We don't always agree with what I'm teaching because people come from all different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, different ways of living, different ways of acting, and different ways of believing. And I understand that fact. However, just because I don't agree with someone and you don't agree with me doesn't mean my heart is changed towards you. My heart will continue to be in a place because I desire a place of compassion and love and instruction because I desire to help you and to love you just like Christ would love you. And the truth, Jesus' message is not relevant to the ideals of society. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus is, is the author of truth. First Corinthians says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus. We can also say the Word of God. Because His name is called 
the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word of God. So, the Word of God is the standard for our life and our living. The Word of God is the standard of how we are to think. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. All Scripture. What is true and make and to make us realize what is wrong. You get that? Our whole scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do right. Praise God that we know and can go to something, someone, which is the Word of God, and know what is right. We don't have to look at our neighbor. We don't have to look at the television. We don't have to look at what's being reported on the Internet to know what is right for our lives. We don't have to look at society around us. We don't even have to look at what is a popular book. The Bible says, let God be true. And every man alive. If everybody on the planet voted the same way for something that goes contrary to what God's word says about it, everybody on the planet would be wrong and God would still be right. We must develop in ourselves the ability to say no. Nancy Reagan got it right. Just say no. And this is something that truly is developed within us. And God's Word is what helps develop strength in us, courage in us, wisdom in us, knowledge in us, to know what is right and what is wrong. And there is no gray in between. The Bible talks about how we're to humble ourselves before God. Well, we can also say we're to humble ourselves before His Word. Man cannot be so prideful in his mind to think that he knows better than God. That is the beginning of the end, right there, folks. But the Bible instructs us to humble ourselves before God. The next words are resist the devil. Say that with me. Resist the devil. Now, if I tell you that you're, you're here in 2014, I say resist the devil. A lot of society will have no idea who the devil is. Okay, I know, yeah, he's evil, he's bad, and he lives in hell. Okay, so I say uh, resist the devil. Okay, when I see him, I'll be sure to resist him. But they don't know that the enemy, our enemy, who is the, de- who is the devil, Satan, he is against you. He's against your family. And he's against you thinking correctly. And he does everything he can to steal the word. Right? But it's knowledge of the truth that sets a man free. So resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. And we need to maintain, I want you to get this, humility in our thought life. Okay? We need to humble our ways of thinking to God's ways of thinking. Say this with me. Thank you, Lord, for revealing to me answers to questions, solutions to problems, direction from our life, and your truth that gives me life. Now open your Bible to Romans 12, too. Mm-hmm. 
That was the disclaimer. I put it up front. Many attorneys put the disclaimer at the end of the message. I put it up front. I want to be right up front with it. I love you. I'm proud to minister to you. I'm proud to minister to people. I love people, but I love God more than I love people. And their ideas and their thoughts and their thinking, right? I don't get up here and try to be the most popular guy in the room. Okay? I stand up here to be the most truthful message I can give to you from God's Word. And I'm telling you, it's been big in my heart for a week and a half. Actually, more than, well, actually longer than that, probably about a month and a half. But today is the day. It is being delivered today. Amen. And if you're going to hear from the Lord, you've got to be willing to do whatever He says. Not just listen with your ears to what fits your right spot. We change our lifestyle to line up with His Word. That's where freedom's at for you. That's where peace is at for you. That's where prosperity's at for you. That's your wealthy place. That's why I go up here and teach. It's not to be hard on anyone in the room. Because I love you. You, you, you. you are my business. I had to say that. You know what I mean by that. You are why I'm up here. And so, but I've got a great responsibility. And I am accountable unto God for what He tells me to do and what He tells me to say and what He tells me to preach. So that just takes the pressure off of me. Has everybody got up out of this room and walked out? I go, Lord, I did what you said. Now you won't do that. <laughs> but my conscience would be clear. Glory to God. And God would not leave you alone if you didn't decide to do that. He would continue to follow after you and chase after you to draw you to Himself. And be not conformed to this world of God, but be transformed by God, the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But the danger is a lot of people don't realize that they need a transformation. They think they got it all figured out. They think they know what they need to know, and they're living in that, in that knowing. But how many of you, you can raise your hands if you like, but how many of you know, how many of you, since you've been saved, and even if you've been saved many, many years, even, even year by year, as you, as you indulge in the Word even more, realize that you have some things wrong in your own thinking? I could raise both hands and both my feet, but I'd fall on my back trying to do it. So I can absolutely tell you that, that each, each week I realize areas that I need to change my thinking even, in, even in a greater level, in, in a greater area, to the things of God. There's just so much to know in terms of truth when truth is revealed to you. But if you have a desire to know the truth, it will be revealed to you. You seek the Bible says, and you will find. You know and the door will be open unto you. God is not holding back. He is designed to pour out His food, the knowledge and wisdom into your life. Amen. Now remember, we can control what we continue to think of. We can control what we continue to think of. You get that? You do not have to be out of control in the arena of your mind and your thoughts. You can be in control. And the devil of the lie would make you think you can't control it, and you need something else to help you control it, some a drug or medication, things like that. And if you're dealing with that and you're on medication for that, I, I'm not doubting you for that. Pastor Andrew said it well. He said, you know what? Their doctors are, in, hopefully, that they're inspiring to get you to the place that God wants to get you to, they're just using the natural side of things, and, and, and God is using the spiritual, the supernatural, the spiritual side of things. But I'm telling you that you can control what you continue to think on and meditate on. Amen. You are not going to be out of your mind. And we say, well, how do we do that? How do you do that, Pastor? Well, I said, first we must find out what we're supposed to think of. 
And we make a commitment, that's what I'm going to think of. And we listen to this. You can get the CD, listen online, whatever else. Things are new things, right? Things that are pure, things that are just, things that are good and poor, honest, all that. Okay? We think on We find out what we're supposed to think on, and then we make a decision that's what I'm going to think on. And we identify what we're not supposed to think on, and we make a commitment, I am not thinking about that anymore. I am not going to meditate on that. Anytime that thought arises up, I'm going to cut that imagination down. I'm going to hold it responsible to God's Word. And we never say, I can't help it. You get it? I said, we never say, I can't help it. Because we do have the ability to choose what we think of. There's a minister, his name is Brother Hagen, he's gone home to be with the Lord. He said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a mess on your head. What he said, what he was saying by that example is, that's going to come to every one of us. That is just who you are. Every minister, every person on the planet has had thoughts come at them that are wicked, perverted, perverse, destructive thoughts. But you do not have to maintain those thoughts in your thinking. You do not have to meditate on those thoughts over and over and over again and exercise those thoughts in your mind. You can do something about every thought that comes into your mind. And if the thought that comes to your mind is contrary to God's word and God's thought, you have the responsibility as a born again Christian to get rid of those thoughts. And you can just say something like, I don't think on these things. You can praise God. You can shout to God. You can sing praises. You say, well, I'm not a singer. I can't do it. Sing. Shout. You can sing and shout. And speak God. Word. Amen. Why am I so strong that? Because I've seen people get slapped into that, into that, into that chamber of I can't help the way I think. And I'm going to encourage you that you can help the way you think. You may not be able to control the thoughts that come to you, but I'm telling you, you resist that thought. You resist that thought. You resist that thought. You resist that imagination. You resist that imagination. And you continue to resist those imaginations and those thoughts and those words that try to exalt themselves against the knowledge and truth of God's Word. You cast them to the ground in the name of Jesus. Use the name that's above every other name. The name of Jesus before you do it. Now remember, we can control what we think of. You are born again, child of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. The greater one's dwelling in you. You are empowered. And if you're not, you can be today before you leave this room. Isaiah 26, 3 says, God will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Say that with me. Whose mind is stayed on thee. God would not give us these instructions if we, if we couldn't do it. But God has given us these instructions. When God gives you instruction in His Word, what are you? You are empowered to do it. Because God's Word is empowering. Every Word of God contains sufficient power to carry it out in your life. Amen. Colossians 3, 2, we look at it, so, and set your mind, say that with me, and set your mind, I mean, Rocky, I'll give you an example, set your mind like a thermostat. You put it on the de- desired temperature, you, you put your mind, you put your thoughts on your, de- on the desired thoughts, the desired results in your life, and you keep them set. You get that? Well, I still don't feel like it now, don't go change the thermostat. Keep your mind set. Keep your thoughts set on things that are above. Amen. There are so many choices in the world. There are so many things, choices, things to think about, right? Choices, choices, choices. The major point of last week. 
about the, about the choices that we make and the choices that are out there. And we've had example after example that there is this one thing. There is one thing. Remember, Mary saw Mary, and Jesus said, Mary had chosen that one thing. We looked at Abraham. Abraham considered next the goodness uh, of his age and the goodness of Sarah's womb. He considered that, and the Bible says he staggered not at the promises of God to one belief. Why? Because he didn't consider the next to the failure. Joshua and Caleb didn't consider not going into the promised land. They said, we are well able to go up the land. They looked at it. They saw the giants. They saw the fortified walls. They saw what they were up against, but they didn't consider it. And the only way God needs to consider all kinds of ways of thinking. And it's danger, danger, danger. If you're, out, if you're um, agitated and you're irritated and confused and worried and anxious and things and all that stuff, what's going on? You're considering things that are not on the menu, right? That's what I said last week. I, I, I just used the Bible as an example of a menu. I said, this is what God has said how we're to think. He didn't say, well, you, you didn't see Jesus getting all irritated and all worked up over things and agitated and, 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 and frustrated and flying off on the handle. And, 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 no. Complete control of his emotions. Well, he didn't consider the other way. They weren't on the menu for him. If it's not on the menu, it's not on the menu. I can't go to Burger King and order sausage. I don't know how I'm saying that right. This is how I can They get it right when they bring it out of the kitchen when I go down to the restaurant. So the what? Oh, sorry, so that's not on our menu. Oh, we didn't even want to. That's great and dandy, but not on the menu. Do you see it up there on the board? No, that's what I really, really want. We can't take it here. We consider things that are not on the menu. We consider things too often that are not in God's Word. We allow ourselves to get worked up and angry and, and irritated and agitated and frustrated. And God says, that's not even on the menu. You're not even be considering thinking like that. Amen, oh me. Why? Well, the enemy loves to give us choices. Options, choices, choices, choices. How we started in the Garden of Eden. There's choice after choice after choice that he began to present to them immediately. And I laid that out through the book in the book of Genesis. And we saw how Eve was looking at all these choices, and I'm look at all these choices. Right? And I'm telling you, the enemy has given us choices to be upset about things, to be bothered. To be irritated, to be frustrated, and those are not choices that come from God. That should not be a choice in our life. And our mind has become corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ and how we learned against it. And remember, the devil is a master at deception, presenting choices and options that are all counterfeit to God's way and God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way, a truth, a life, the way, the truth, and the life. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, and things can make, things can seem so holy. <laughs> Reason at all. And things can seem to make so much sense over here. When God says, No, it's wrong. It's sin. But that doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like they're really hurting anybody. Sin doesn't matter if it's hurting somebody or not. It is hurting somebody, but that's not, you know logically look at a lifestyle or a way of living or a way of thinking and say, well, it doesn't seem like it's really hurting anybody else. Let's call it okay. It's not okay. Sin is sin. 
And there is no greater or lesser sin. Sin is sin, people. Say sin is sin. You know, sin is the rejecting of life. It's a rejecting of what is true. And what you can see is true in God's Word. Well, I don't believe that. I don't know what you're saying, Pastor, but you know. Proverbs 3 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. The message translation I read last week is Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. You hear that? Don't assume that you know it all. Right? Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Satan hates it when you grow with health and life. He is a destroyer. He is a thief. And his motive is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And religion has tried to cause even religious, religion, I say religion, what I mean is, if, if you don't hear a strong message like this, in your life, you got to be really cautious because I've seen where religion has almost had people bury their heads in the sand, and, and even God loving people question if there's even a devil. Well, you know, I'm not really sure if there is Satan. Or if it's in the Bible. Right? Well, I don't know if he's all as bad as he says he is. And look at the movie. Look at the murders. Look at the suicides. Look at the, the things going on. Talk to a paramedic for five minutes and ask him what that means was like. Then, then, then you think, is there a devil or not? Decisions affect our life. The decisions we make have a major impact and effect on our life, don't they? And making unvalued decisions will affect you differently than making spirit-led God decisions, Word of God decisions, right? But remember, you have the one who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end, living in you and helping you with those decisions, right? And the key to living a stress-free life is to seek the Lord first. Amen? Say this, I am loved by the Spirit of God. I hear His voice. I follow his leading. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not in a hurry to make a wrong decision. But I am patient in what I do. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 10 35 says, So don't throw away your confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it, will, it brings to you. Now, the devil can deceive people into problems and troubled places. I said the devil can deceive people into problems and troubled places in their life. But I'm telling you that much more can the Spirit of the Lord lead us into a wealthy place, into a place of victory, into a place of peace. Amen? Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. Yeah, 2 Kings chapter 5. There's no sense in being conformed to this world. Amen? We are Christians, and when, as born-again Christians, we have the ability to absolutely transform. Into what? Into what God has called and created us to be. I'm going to talk to you about a king and about a prophet, or about a captain, I should say, Captain of the King series. And uh, this king, uh, this man, this captain, his name is Naaman. And he had a disease called leprosy. Leprosy is a disease where uh, your, your flesh begins to rot. 
begins to fall off your body. Very grotesque looking disease. I don't know if you've ever gone online and looked at pictures of people with leprosy, but it is an awful sight. And here, he's desiring to be free from this disease. And uh, he goes to the man of God, here the prophet of God, and is looking for an answer. And what happens then, Elijah hears from God, and he sends a messenger to go meet this, this man, this captain. And this guy was a high-ranking official. This guy was important, if you will, okay? And you just don't send some, a messenger to go talk to him. When he wants to come see you, he is used to you coming to talk to him. Okay? So I'm sending you out to have an idea. What it says is, when I sent a messenger out with this message, go and wrap yourself seven times in the Jordan River. I've got the leprosy. I'm going to see the prophet of God. I need help. And he's telling me, he doesn't even come to me directly. He sends a messenger. What, is he too busy? He sends a messenger to tell me this message of how I'm going to be healed. He's expecting the guy to come out and pray for him and lay hands on him, whatever else. And he tells him to go dip seven times as if one time wouldn't be enough. I want you to think of a logic. And where your mind would begin to go if you were in an army. Was that guy think he's too good for me? I'm a captain. Thought number one, probably. Number two, go and wash myself seven times. Why wouldn't one time be enough? Talk perhaps thought number three. The Jordan River? It's awful. It was filthy. It was dirty. It was not the cleanest of rivers in the area. He has got relatively open wounds to his flesh, which can cause infection, which can kill him. The Jordan River? Right? What am I getting at? I'm getting at how we are to trust in the Lord. And lean not on our own understanding. He says, then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. leprosy. But the Ammon became angry and stopped away. Say, angry and stopped away. A choice that's not on the menu for us. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. Right? Number one. Number two, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. That's what he expected. Number three, aren't the rivers of Damascus better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't, why shouldn't I walk in them and be healed? So now he turned and went away in a rage. In a rage. He's angry. He's hurting. But an officer tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says something so simple. Go wash, go and wash, and be cured. You know, you may have been here today, and somebody may have invited you here today, and you may be doing the things in your life, and if you listen, I just really believe you should come and hear the message here. I really believe you should come here this pastor. This is, this is a church, you know, it's a good church and a good message, things like that. And you may be thinking, what does it have to do with what I'm dealing with? What does it have to do with my life? I've tried all kinds of things. I've tried this, I've tried that. I need money, or I need drugs, or I need alcohol, or I need, you know, whatever it may be. Or, or you can just say, I don't need that. Right? Right? I mean, just like Jeff said, it, and Jeff's a very faithful man, faithful to God, faithful to his wife, faithful to, to the ministry. But men's meetings, Saturday morning, 7 a.m., really? 
What he didn't tell you is he's going out of town to Texas to the Bleeders Convention. He'll be sitting in meetings for about eight hours a day for the next week hearing preaching. And I guarantee you his mind is going, you're going to get plenty next week. One more day of missing it isn't going to hurt you. And he said the message that he heard changed his marriage forever. I can tell you this for me too. It's just I believe it was for everybody there to change our lives. It was a help. And this, this man said to them, if you had told you something difficult to do, would you have done that? He gave you something very simple. Isn't there a simplicity in Christ that we just read about last week? God was giving this man instruction of something that was very capable and very easy for him to do in the natural. Go get yourself seven times in the muddy Jordan River. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself once, twice, three times, right? Four, five, six. Every time he came out of that river, he, he's thinking, <laughs> this seems so foolish. Wouldn't, wouldn't you hope that maybe like you're getting a little bit better at every dip, <laughs> which would keep you dipping? <laughs> but the Bible didn't say it, did it? So now I'm going to and dip himself seven times as the man of God had instructed. As the man of God had instructed. As his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. Simple obedience, folks. This simple obedience is still available and, and, and expected of us in 2014. You may have something else you're battling with. You may be something else you're dealing with. You may be in the arena of your mind, right? You may be just bombarded by negative, defeating, self-defeating, thoughts of suicide or perversion and wickedness and something else. Oh, what do I do? Lean out on your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I do, I do, I do. Walking in in a greater way. Had a great expectation on the things of God. You know, one thing they haven't did is they haven't did expect to be healed. It's just how he received his healing is not what he expected. But he did expect to be healed. You know, the blind man, Mike chapter 8, says that. Well, I'm going to read. Uh, go ahead and go there. We're okay. Go to, go to Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Here they bring a blind man, verse 23, Mark 8, 23. They, they bring this blind man of Jesus, and they're asking him to touch him. Verse 23 says, And took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw it. And he looked up and said, I see men as after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. They look up. God's word causes us to look up. You know, one thing I've seen. With the spirit of depression, if people eyes typically go down. And 
I've seen consistent when people are just walking in faith and living out the Word of God in their lives, is the rise of us. So lift your eyes. To knock down like this and to discourage. And I'm telling you, you may be here today, and you may be looking down a long time. And you may not even realize that you've been looking down. But today, you're going to leave here looking up. I mean that. This is so big in my spirit today. Well, you know, I just don't know. I just can't see how that could possibly happen to me. Let me tell you something. God sees the whole picture. And He knows how to set every one of us free, how to help every one of us in every area of our life, every marriage in the room, every relationship in the room, every every person in the room is sitting here thinking different thoughts, right? Every one of us has thoughts in here going on in our mind. And I'm telling you, He knows exactly how to minister and how to help each and every person in this room. Every one of you. And it may not make sense to you how it's going to happen. I just encourage you that as you're hearing the words that I'm teaching and the word that's coming from this Bible here, there's something that's going to happen inside you called faith. And a faith is a spiritual force. And a spiritual force of faith can move you. And it can definitely heal you and deliver you and encourage you and put you over the top. And it can bring you to your wealthy place. Because there is a wealthy place. I'll go ahead and go to it, but not today. Maybe next week it's in Psalm. And he talks about how there is a wealthy place for his people. Amen? You know, Jesus' mother had it right. She said, just do what he said. That's not that complicated, is it? That's the same message as today. Just do what he said. Just do what his word says. Amen. Well, we're going to get it into good stuff. That was good, but this is gooder. Pretty good, I said. You know, Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient, say that with me, willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. One minister said, I might touch you, but I'll throw you up before you leave. <laughs> Some people are like, what is that? I can't believe that happened. It's pretty good. What I mean by that is, Maybe some areas in your life that have been able to cut through it with the truth. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent. Say, Repent. And the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means to have to do with in the Greek word methanel, which means to change your way of thinking. Or 180 degrees. It's a completely different direction than where you were before. So when he's talking about repent, um, it's important to understand that he's not, he's not talking about, like a lot of people think of the word repent. It can mean this, but a lot of times when you say the word repent, a lot of people think they have to fall on their knees and, and start rehearsing all their sins. Right? And you can do that. That's, there's nothing wrong with repenting in that way, I, I suppose. But Jesus is saying repent, and he's saying he's telling people to change your way of thinking. He says, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'm telling you, the kingdom of God is a complete different way of thinking compared to how the people were thinking then and really compared to how people are even thinking today. So it's going to take us changing the way we think. And I'm telling you, Jesus was not against these people because of the way they were thinking. He is trying to help these people as a result of the way they were thinking. And he wasn't against them being in bondage. He just wanted to deliver them from being in bondage. Amen? And we can have the same compassion for people as Jesus 
We shouldn't just accept the way people have become and their lifestyles and make be compassionate towards them. I call that complacency. We don't need to be complacent as Christians. We can be compassionate. Well, what is compassion? Well, here's compassion in my idea. If somebody is in danger, compassion says, you're in danger! Complacency is, I see that you're in danger and go, I respect your opinion. I respect your lifestyle. I respect the way you're thinking. If you don't know that, most people don't even know they're deceived or deceived. That's the whole idea of deception. And the Bible says we've all been misdemeaned. It doesn't make you better than them. It just means that you have the light in that area, and so you're going to help them with the truth in that area. And God knows there's areas in your life that you need help in too. There are people in my life that I've helped in areas where I have light and understanding, and guess what? They get up, look to me now, they're doing great, and we become friends, we've been close to them, and they're at the point where they're helping me in areas of my life. That's the body of Christ. What does it mean you're greater than them, smarter than them, better than them? It means you have compassion on them. And it means you want to help them. And you're not going to let them go down that road just because you want to respect their opinion on something. Amen. The Bible says you speak the truth in love. Then you say you speak love. So speak the truth in love, in thinking. Right? Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth in love. Say the truth in love. Because you may grow up into, into him and all things. You've been growing up. Right? And we all don't grow up. Well, I did a whole teaching on growing up. Right? We all teaching on growing up. And so we all have areas that we're growing in. Every one of us. Go to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Stay with me now. Praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. Amen. Is that the one? Hmm. Not from you. After the devil. You know, David ran up a lot. He brought the fight to him. You know what I'm doing this morning? I'm bringing the fight to the devil. And I'm bringing the fight to people who have been trapped in their minds, and people who have been lied to, and people who have been deceived in the church. And I'm ready. Hallelujah. When you know, when you, know you win, why not go into the ring? We win. Read the back of the Bible. We win. Besides that, I'm leaving our time right after service too. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, 16. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Say, I'm not ashamed. Now, I'm telling you, the real thing you have to talk about is, this, is because the devil will have you make you feel ashamed of who you are as a Christian. And we don't have to be ashamed. I said, we don't have to be ashamed of being a Christian and standing up for what is right. Amen. Now, well, well, you know, this is just a old fashioned and they're really not kind of with it. You know, I mean, society, you know, has changed, and, you know, most Christians are, you know, you're kind of behind the times, Pastor, and, and you know, you're kind of, kind of religious, too, you know, and, and, you know, people just need to be free to express who they are, and be who they are, and do the things they want to do. Keep <laughs> reading. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Yes, they are. 
even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Hmm. I'll get to that in a minute. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They became vain in their imagination. They vain in their imagination. That's in your mind, people. Okay? And their foolish heart was darkened. They darkened. And you can't see clearly. They don't clarity. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. There are people, television, personality, television hosts of shows, political people, who think they are so wise, and yet are so foolish people. So it says here that we can look at God's wonderful, beautiful, magnificent creation. Just by looking at it, we can say, oh my goodness, this is God. Look at the universe. Look at this earth. Look at the oceans. Look at the fish. I mean, this is something I remind my children. When we, go, when we go to the beach, we say, I mean, and you see the little detail things in the sea urchins and the starfish and the birds and the bat and everything else, I'm reminding them, God. God. I mean, it's amazing. And we find things that we don't even know about. And what was the name of that? And we try to go find it on the computer. What was the name of that thing? But we know where it all came from. God. God. Are people that don't think that? Make me laugh. And it's like they have this idea, and I got this little example, and I know it's a little far up, but I want to give you this, idea, this example. It's like taking a bunch of C4 explosives and taking them down to a junkyard, scrapyard. I don't know if you've ever been to a junkyard or a scrapyard. And putting these explosives in the scrapyard and igniting these explosives in. Right? And then all the dust settles, and you go, there's a new Mercedes. It is. It's blew it all together. It's never happened, and it'll never happen. It takes somebody putting their hands on that car, creating machines to make the car and crafting it and putting it together to make a beautiful Mercedes thing. You get to blow a bunch of stuff up and get the life that we see on this planet. It is from our Creator. And He created everything here and He created you and me. And He breathed His breath of life into us. You're empowered by the Creator. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who change, or another word in here is exchange, okay, they exchange the truth of God into a lie. The truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, we are to worship the Creator, not the creation. On uh, Thursday, I've been teaching on this, and you know this. How man is God's most prized possession. You are the apple of the God, right? We've looked at that for about two or three weeks now. You know, being deceived is when you begin to believe a lie. Let me say that again. Being deceived is when you begin to believe a lie. Let me keep reading here. For this cause gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even their women did change the natural youth into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the nature, uh, the natural youth of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was deep. Now, this is what is referred to today as sort of a political correct way of saying a further lifestyle. Oh, pretty close. And there is an enormous pressure in the world and in society to accept this way of living as being okay. Listen, I'm not against people. I told you that. So I put my disclaimer in the beginning. I love people, but I am against people living in bondage and living lost and living confused. And people like myself and yourself need to be willing to stand up for what is true and what is right. Not in a way to be a debate or an argument, perhaps, but in a way that is strong and confident in what is true and what is right, and not accepting what is wrong. Let me just the New Living Translation in case that there was any unclarity in it. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God, or even give Him thanks. Giving God thanks should be a part of our everyday life. You know, that's where a lot of depression can sneak in. Thank you, Lord. You get that? I said, that is where a lot of depression can, can sneak into people's lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because what can happen is the enemy can get you so focused on the, what you don't have and the areas and struggles and the challenges that you're dealing with. But there is a way to flash that by just giving God praise for every good and perfect gift that He has. And it says, I come down from the Father of life. Lord, I just thank you for my health. I thank you for my eyesight. I thank you for the strength I have. I thank you for my children. I thank you for the car I drive. I thank you for the home. I thank you for the, the county that we're living in. I thank you. I just begin to thank God for His creation. Thank you for the ocean. Thank you for the Gulf of Mexico. Thank you for the sand, the birds, whatever. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for the food that are about the Thank you for the men and women who, who have grown this food and planted this food and cultivated this food and worked hard and fixed their tractors and their trucks and did this and the truck driver that drove it here and the grocer that, that goes into work at the grocery store and, and puts it on the shelf and sells it and tax registered and puts it in the ring. Thank you for them, Lord. Well, I have to go to a convenient place, buy food, and come back and eat it. Amen. Well, I want to live in nature. Go ahead. I don't mind doing that. I hunt and fish and things like that. That's cool. That's great. But how else did you do it all the time? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard work. Hunting is hard work. Fishing is hard work. Hmm. And then again, to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. I saw a very popular show on TV, a little clip from a show, actually, and it was a man, a political man, he was a born-again man, and he, and he was talking with this talk show host, and this talk show host was just going, you know, trying to set him up and trying to trap him. And this guy was so anointed of God, this politician, this born again politician, and how he answered every biblical question. This guy was trying to make things up of the way God was, and he was taking one little uh, portion of the Bible and then trying to spread it across and make it a blanket sweep, you know, thing, there, and then laughing at the man of God. And I was, I was literally like, I, oh, oh. but the man of God that was this politician and the man of God was so calm in his delivery and so undeterred at the way this guy was talking to him. You could just see the peace of God on his life, and you could see the knowledge of the truth. Because the Bible says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
One man knew the truth. The other man had written some stuff down about the Bible. And he didn't know it. Like this guy knew it. This guy is free, and this guy is in bondage, people. And the people make up things the way God is, and as a result, their minds become dark and confused. We're living in a world where there are a lot of, there's a lot of darkness, a lot of confused people about who God is. Learning to be wise, they instead became other fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did bow and degrade things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who was worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their sinful desires. Even the women turned against the natural ways to have sex and instead indulged in sex with one another. And men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. They never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, calling, deception, malice, behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They refuse to understand. Break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. Yet, they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Still with me? Listen, there is no alternative to the truth. I said there is no alternative to the truth. Because when it's sin, now, how does a person get to this place? It starts with a thought. And the devil knows that. I said it starts with a thought, and the devil knows that. I don't care if we're talking about homosexuality, if we're talking about adultery, it starts with a thought. Say that with me. It starts with a thought. Depression, it starts with a thought. Well, you know, uh, he says he can't help it, and that's just the way he is. He was born that way. No, it's what he has become. I said, it's what he's become. He or she's become. It's not the way God created them or God intended for them to live. It's a thought that they took, a feeling they took, and they meditated on it. And they thought about it a little more, and they thought about it a little more, and they thought about it a little more, and then they thought that that's the way I am. Amen. Well, you know, I think we need to respect people. But you see, people who think this way are very selective in how they think. What about the adulterer? Well, I've always watched women. You have a genetic. Yeah, I know. But I want that guy's life now. Like you know, my back guy's wife. You know, my back guy's wife. Well, get away from me. I don't want to do it. But, yeah, but, but no, he, he just needs to respect him. Because that's just the way he was born. He's been that way his whole life. He just likes women. So go ahead and give him your wife because that, he can't help it. Wait a minute. No. Amen. Take it to the next step. We're about to cut a 
and this is the way he was born. Like children, can't help themselves. We might need to let the pedophiles express themselves and have their pedophile day. And you get thrown in here. We're going to draw the line with this. I said, we're going to draw the line with this. I'm just saying that sin is sin. And bondage is bondage. And if God's word says it's sin and it's not right, it's not right, people. And Satan is so deceptive, making you think, well, you don't love them. It's not a matter of loving them. You do love them. That's why you stand for the truth. That's why you stand up for what is right. You don't have to get their face and, and put a sign in their face and tell them they're wrong. But do you pray for them? When you see them, do you believe God and speak God's word? You just kind of go, it's okay. And you know, I, I, I respect what you're doing. No, you can respect them without respecting what they're doing. I'm not saying you disrespect the person. Not what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't stand for what they're doing and what they're living and how they're living. I don't care what the sin is, okay? I don't care what it is. It's the only thing still there. I'm not going to tell you it makes no difference. Worry is a sin. A lot of Christians are worrying about things. You're going to love it. But boy, you talk about somebody else, you know, it's a homosexual, they don't want to work up. You're just sitting there worrying about this and worrying about that and worrying about this. That's a sin also. And it's deadly. It's bondage. So know the truth. And the truth can make you free. Go with me to Mark chapter 5. And I'll close it with. And I'll go quickly. I love you. I told you I'm in the people business, but I put my disclaimer up for it. And Jesus loves you. And God loves you. And God so loved the world. And the world was living in sin and living in immorality. The world was living in darkness. And, and God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for giving your life for us, for caring about us. And it says, for God sent not his son into the world. Listen to this. I'm not going to mark. I'm going to read this to you. This is John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world. You're doing wrong. You're doing wrong. You're doing wrong. You're doing wrong. And you're doing wrong. So he sent him not in the world to condemn the world. But he sent him into the world that the world through him might be saved. And we know when we say through him, we can say through his word. But we're going to be saved from, from that bondage by accepting and living in the truth, walking in the light. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his mercy. And I've known people who have, who have lived crazy about that. I know people who have committed murder. And I've seen them born again, spiritual, happy. Free, filled with peace, filled with joy, filled with the love of God, married, family, and telling other people about Jesus. That's the way to live free. God wants us free. He wants everybody on the planet free. He didn't come to the world to condemn the world. He came to that they could be saved through his son Jesus. Mark chapter 5, it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, I already gave you this example uh, in Mark chapter 4 about how they went across the sea, right? So this is the next chapter, right after they just got out of that great storm. And that was a great time. Let me tell you something. The devil didn't want you hearing this message today. You hear me? I said, the devil didn't want you to hear this message today. You're hearing it too late. And don't be distracted. You're hearing it. Mark 5 1. And they came, across, they came over to the other side of the sea, into the country of Gadarene. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there came, they met him out of the tombs of man with an unclean spirit who had 
Stop dwelling, living in the tombs. He lived in the tombs, people, where dead people live. Okay? Okay, he lived in the tombs where dead people live. Let me say to something, and you might go, oh, now, Pastor, now you said nothing, you know, there. Hey, the whole idea of skull and death and all that stuff that goes with that is not for you. It's life. But it, but it's something that's trying to work it dead. Notice when this guy has an unclean spirit and is tormented by devils, where is he living? In the tomb. The picture of death. And no man could bind him, no, not with shame. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. He's like a wild Beast of a man. The modern power. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. They're cutting himself. It's nothing new. And it's demonic, it's satanic, it's not from God. Cutting himself. They're cutting himself. Well, how do you want to start cutting himself? He took a fact that was not from God. Hey, pick up that stone. Cut yourself. I cut myself. That came again. Look at that stone. Cut yourself. Cut yourself. Don't do it now. Don't do it crazy. Cut yourself. Come on, cut yourself. Follow your thought, people. This guy wasn't walking down the road and all of a sudden. He wasn't afraid of that. That cut himself. We got to be just in the room. You know that? Well, did you get this? One thought at a time. How did it, the legion of demons get in him? One thought at a time. He took one perverted thought, another wicked thought, another wicked thought, another wicked thought, until he was consumed with thinking like these demons. And these demons are all about their master's business. And their master's business is to steal, to kill, and to destroy them. And you can see that's exactly what was happening. And he was terrorizing this entire coast. They tried to turn it up, and he ripped the chains off. One thought at a time. Say one thought at a time. Suicide comes from the fact. It's a deadly destructive thought. Not from God. God loves you. God wants you to live and be healthy and whole and prosper in your life. In your marriage, your relationship, it is never too late. I said it's never too late. This guy was in bad shape, wasn't he? He was naked, cutting himself, ripping, ripping uh, chains off of his body, and he couldn't even stand him. And he's always at night and day in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, the son of the Most High God? <coughs> I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Torment him? Torment him? This guy is already tormented. Talk about as tormented as they come. But see, that's exactly the deception that Satan uses. That God's truth in His Word is somehow tormenting the people. I don't want to live like those church people. I don't want to live like those faith people. That is the way to live. I'm just telling you. We're going to live and walk by faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Does that torment me? This guy is thinking he's going to be tormented by Jesus? That's how far his mind is gone. For he said unto him, Come, I have a man 
by the unclean spirit. And he asked him, well, I'll jump forward for a time. Look at verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. This is the guy we were talking about. And had the legion. This guy had over 7,000 demons in him. Sitting. Not living around anymore. Sitting. And clothed. That is their clothes on. And in his right mind. And in his what? Right mind. Satan had taken him out of his right mind one thought at a time. And it was trap, it's deception, and it's bondage. You are not in your right mind. How do I get in my right mind? This word is the truth that can only give us and put us and keep us and maintain us in a right mind. Did you get something like this today? I know it was a strong message. I know it was a powerful message. It was big in my heart, big in my spirit, because I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd teach a marshmallow message to you, a milk toast message to you. But I wouldn't be doing you any favor if I'm not obedient. Again, I love people. I have friends. They're living in a lifestyle of homosexuality. I love them as much as I love you. But do I agree with the lifestyle? No. Well, I want them to be free. I have compassion to them. I talk to them about these things. I'm not afraid to talk to them about these things. I don't argue. I don't debate. I just talk to them about the truth of the Word. Okay? I want you to know that. If you're here today, and you've been struggling, or have struggled ever in your life, and you don't feel free in these areas. And I talked about a lot of areas today. I talked about homosexuality. I talked about immorality, right? I talked about cutting. I talked about suicide. I talked about a lot of areas. Bondage. I talked about worry, right? I believe the power of God is present today to set you free. Just like that man got set free. I want to tell you something. There was a great storm that Jesus and the disciples met going across that sea to get to this man. And that man may have been quite a bit for you to get here this morning. I'm going to tell you this, honestly, it took a lot for me to be here this morning. I was sick all night. And everything in me was telling me, you can't preach that message tomorrow. You can't preach that message tomorrow. I wasn't throwing up there. I had massive headaches. Massive headaches. And it started as soon as I went back into prayer and studying for this message. And you know what I told the devil? There may be a great storm, but there's a great calm. Stand your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to confess some things. And now we're confessing this confession together. You know, salvation comes by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. Right? Well, what the Lord is instructing me to do is ask how you're going to receive your deliverance and your healing and freedom from bondage is by confessing what we're going to discuss, but also believing in your heart that as of right now today, you are free in Jesus' name. June 29, 449 p.m., you are free from this. I am holding fast to what I know and what I hear from the truth of God's Word. My adversary, and I know I have an adversary, it is the devil, cannot have or think what God has made available to me. 
which is love, peace, salvation, power, and a sound mind. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to recognize the gifts that are in me and before me. I refuse to yield to the to the to the spiritual frustration and worry. I will not be discouraged. I will remain sober, vigilant, and aware of my adversaries. And I bring every step to the obedience of Christ. Because there is no reason why I have to give in to my feelings or facts that are contrary to God's word. I feel what I allow my mind to think of. The nature of my Heavenly Father is reflected in my life on a daily basis. I don't have to know all the details to make the right decisions. I can look to you, Lord, the author, the developer, and the finisher of my faith. Guilt and condemnation have no place in my life. I receive your forgiveness and I operate and love in your saving grace. And I have been the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'll give it a I'll give it a Thank you! Thank you, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I believe people are set free in Jesus' name. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. It's been so strong in my spirit. I appreciate your attentiveness. I appreciate your patience. I appreciate your enjoyment to be able to grow, to learn, and to have a pastor that can speak over you and into your life. I love you. You're good looking. Amen. Amen. Your brother, my friend, is nice for you and nice for you. Everything you said is healthy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.